Liberalism has been described as the political creed of the bourgeoisie in Europe and it became particularly relevant to European societies and politics in the first half of the 19th century. The basic assumption was that government was to be different from the governments of the dynastic monarchies of the 18th century in the sense that the communities and the state must be related in a sense of organic unity. Governments would no longer be the exclusive concern of the kings and his ministers, but must address itself to the welfare of the entire community. Government would also have to be based on the consent of the governed, particularly those uh, who were the more influential section of the society. The Americans had asserted this during the American uh, Revolution by suggesting that the governments must be instituted among men and government has to be dependent uh, on the consent of the governed. The European liberals were broadly in, in agreement with these views. But the point was that the Austrian regimes in Europe had all been predicated on privilege, as we have seen uh, several times earlier. The privileges were the exclusive domain of the landed aristocracy and of high clergy. Businessmen and merchants traders, manufacturers and the lower orders were excluded from this privilege. The French Revolution in a, in a way also was based on certain liberal ideas and, and it indeed gave expression to uh, these liberal ideas. As a, as a result, the beneficiaries of the revolution had been some of these classes, the bourgeoisie in, in particular. The philosophical inspiration came from John Locke, Tom Paine, Mortescu or Rousseau. The, the ideas of the, uh, these thinkers of the 17th and the 18th centuries meant that they were providing the base of the new liberal and constitutional ideas which uh, provided the, the basis of governance and of government in the late 18th and early 19th century. The main concern was to humanize political operations uh, by trying to secure a the rule of law, b by basing government on the consent of the governed, at least of the more influential and the property elements of the governed, c to introduce a system of checks and balances uh, in, in order to prevent arbitrary government and D to protect and establish the rights of the individuals. The demand for political liberty also gradually uh, uh, emerged and had a, a very special meaning in this historical epoch. Liberalism thus made a strong attack on inequality and on arbitrary government of the 18th century. They wanted a constitutional arrangement. Government would be based on a constitution. There should be a representative assembly based at least on the basis of restricted and property based franchise. Liberty of the individuals must be protected by the operation of rule of law, uh, as would be the right to property. Uh, what they sought was certainly not democracy, uh, because the concept of sovereignty that was being uh, suggested was not one that could be derived from the ideas of Rousseau. It was the sovereignty of parliamentary assemblies rather than the sovereignty of the people. Uh, what they would have really wanted was uh, 
some kind of a constitutional monarchy or maybe a constitutional and moderate form of republican uh, government. After 1815, when restoration uh, was uh, uh, the, the order uh, after the Vienna Congress, they felt a little anxious about the possibility of restoration of arbitrary government and a restoration of the privileges. In England, uh, at the turn of the century, the most significant figure of a thinker was that of Jeremy Bentham. His ideas of utilitarianism uh, was to inform the understanding of the liberals and even many of the philosophical radicals in the first half of the 19th century. It is a curious the coincidence that the two books of Bentham were published on the dates of the American and the French Revolution. The Fragments of Government was published in 1776 and the introduction to the principles of morals and legislations came in 1789. He belonged to the revolutionary age but certainly did not have any relation with revolutionary thought. He was also contem contemptuous of the traditional philosophy and tried to treat a, a, a path in between the two. It has been noted that he was virtually forgotten uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 18th century. In the early 19th century uh, or a little later, he was rediscovered as it were by James Mill. And later he virtually acquired a oracular fame to a whole lot of later generation people. Apart from James Mill, those who were passionately attached to uh, uh, Bentham and his ideas of utilitarianism included David Ricardo, George Grote, John Austin and John Stuart Mill. Now, if this is what liberalism sought to achieve, we have seen that the French Revolution uh, tried to instill some of these liberal tenets into the constitutions which were drafted. During the French Revolution, there was also a democratic aspiration that had been sought to be asserted at least during the Jacobin period. But it was in England that liberalism, uh, it is conceded, had the greatest uh, role in influencing governmental thinking and in the introduction of reforms. Britain was therefore at this time, because of the revolutions in the 17th century, a prime example of constitutional, representative, if also somewhat oligarchic form of government. Parliamentary habits were now fairly well entrenched in Britain, but it would, it would be wrong to presume that the parliamentary system as it functioned in England in the early 19th century was the same as the parliamentary system with which we are familiar today. Parliamentary constitution at least was working, but we must understand that the electorate was still very limited. The Tories were mostly in power. Lord Liverpool had uh, been in charge till 1827. Britain did experience difficulties uh, after the or, or during what is called the restoration period. We might put it this way, that in Britain, uh, because of some influence of liberalism, governments appeared to be responsive to the needs of the people during a crisis and could adopt some measures. The European uh, governments generally turned a blind eye to uh, uh, this and, and reforms were not always forthcoming. Monarchy, however, did not enjoy a great reputation in England at this time. Neither the Regency nor the rule of George IV uh, 
provided to be particularly popular. William the Fourth was less unpopular, but was not particularly effective as a king. As David Thompson puts it, I'm quoting, quote, the monarchy before the accession of Queen Victoria was surviving in spite of monarchs, unquote. Now, legislations during this period addressed certain basic problems that affected the larger majority of the people. First, how would the government control the possibilities of association making, particularly trade union activities? We must remember that in England, the Industrial Revolution had already been achieved. It is believed that between in the last two decades of the uh, 18th century, the industrial economy took off to use the uh, Rostovian metaphor uh, into an industrial economy. Now, if this was quite consistent with the liberalism that the bourgeoisie had adopted at its political creed, it, has, it must be remembered that the Industrial Revolution also produced a new social class, the working class. And their condition left almost everything to be desired, as you know, by, by mid-19th century, the novels of Dickens uh, portrayed the misery, the utter misery that the working class people had. And this led to the ideas of the need for the working class to organize and to, to make their demands. This was on the one side. On the other hand, the older uh, kind of small artisanal classes, daily labor, they had a very anxious uh, kind of an existence because of the intrusion of industrialization into the old structure a productive system in, in different uh, areas, particularly in the rural areas. The combination laws at the end of the 18th century had virtually privated all kinds of associations. But the workers, the older artisanal classes, had been seeking to articulate their uh, problems. And, and we have this uh, duality. There were these older artisanal elements and the new working class who we shall see later way being uh, sought to be organized by a new doctrine of socialism. We are now trying to look at the way liberalism worked and address these problems. Francis Place, who has been described as the radical tailor of Charing Cross, uh, led a movement to repeal these combination laws. The laws were repealed in 1824. Open associations by even the working classes had been somewhat allowed. But when these were uh, repealed, the new enthusiasm tended to not only produce uh, new associations, but lead to a series of strikes and even incidents of violence. So in 1825, the government proposed a new legislation which sought to control violence and, and other such acts, uh, though not eliminate the right to form associations. But even the limited freedom that was granted was very clearly used by the trade unions. The workers who could now organize, draw their constitutions, frame their rules of association, and no longer needed to act almost like secret societies. And all that they wanted was the right to bargain with their employers to improve their a second aspect in which uh, uh, the government was called upon to act was the problem of the religious minorities, particularly of the Protestant dissenters and of the Roman Catholics. There had been a whole series of disabilities on them and it was necessary to address their problems. The total number of non-conformists uh, amounted to about two millions. First, the disabilities of holding high offices, of getting a commission in the army, had been removed for the Protestant uh, dissenters. Then in 1828-29, some of these were removed for the Roman Catholics as well.
But there was still the question of recognizing the basic rights of the Roman Catholics. For example, Roman Catholics could not become members of parliament and that became a major problem. The problem was particularly uh, serious in Ireland where uh, Daniel O'Connor uh, revived an older Catholic association and he started collecting oh, one penny as subscription. This was nicknamed as the Catholic rent. The objective was to collect this money to support candidates for parliament who would at least be vocal in supporting the Catholic cause. But the problem was that these members had to be Protestants as the Catholics could not sit uh, in, in Parliament. They could be at Westminster. Now, the G Catholics tried to persuade the government to grant them these rights. Indeed, O'Connell was elected to Parliament from Clare in 1828. But as he was a Roman Catholic, he could not take his seat in Parliament. And there was a persistent demand to remove this disability. The government faced now a dilemma, either recognize this right of the Roman Catholics or face a civil war. Indeed, Duke of Wellington had warned the House of Lords about the possibility of a civil war. Uh, and ultimately, the, the king was also reluctant, but Robert Peel uh, moved the bill in the Commons and the new act removed the restrictions on the Roman Catholics about holding of offices, uh, except for a few specified ones. In a way, they were now put on the same pedestal as the dissenting Roman Catholics. Now, while these changes were being introduced, something that one doesn't quite see on the continent it is not possible to suggest that the influence of liberalism was strong. Many of these reforms had come in spite uh, of a degree of reluctance and in the face of persistent and occasionally violent demands for such reforms. Franchise was still restricted. The parliamentary system particularly electioneering, had been open or subjected to corrupt practices and, and abuses. In Ireland, the political nation comprised only 26,000 men. The Catholic associations were suppressed. And the point to note is that while religious liberty could be granted, political and civil liberties were restricted. Major John Cartwright, an old radical, he started what came to be known as the Hamden Clubs in London. These clubs, they brought together uh, like-minded people, were very limited in their membership, were scattered over a wide uh, uh, area, but they played a very crucial role in preparing public opinion in support of a few basic uh, demands. And what these demands had been was they wanted political rights, reform of the parliament and the elections, and more importantly, universal suffrage. It is not that these radicals who continue to put pressure on the liberals for further reforms uh, had represented one homogeneous group. There were differences among them there were radicals and there were moderates. Uh, men like Cartwright, uh, Henry Hunt and William Cobbett, uh, they worked uh, very uh, arduously to arouse and exploit the discontent which existed amongst the common people, particularly the lower order. Stratagem that they followed was to draw petitions to parliament. From the 17th century, there had been restrictions on this, that the number of people who could sign a, 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 a petition. But they very cleverly 
maneuvered their way into drawing several petitions so that one petition uh, did not exceed the total number of uh, signatures for which there was a restriction in, in vogue. They also tried to educate people and to, to articulate their, their demands by creating or by preparing a, a public opinion. There was a great deal of uh, a resentment against the Corn Laws, for example, of 1815, because the perception was that the Corn Laws made bread costlier and therefore it was, it, it created difficulties for the common people. The Whigs, the moderate Whigs, the Liberals, of course, disapproved of this. And it is in this context that we need to see that when faced with genuine opposition, the Liberals would recede as other governments on the continent to a repressive policy. One excellent example was what came to be known as the Peterloo Massacre. The government took very serious and repressive measure against this. What is this Peterloo Massacre? It, it was a result of government's very intemperate response to an organization of protest uh, suggesting that the people would like to launch a movement. Uh, on 16th of August 1819, a huge gathering uh, took place in what is now the St. Peter's Square in Manchester. There are about 60,000 uh, people. They were for enlargement of the franchise. They were against poverty. They wanted or demanded anti-poverty measures. As a result of government action, an estimated 18 people, including a woman and child, died. Over 700 men, women and children received extremely serious injuries. What did exactly happen? In this gathering, there was a key speaker. He was Henry Hunt. Huge banners had gone out and the banners said reform, universal suffrage, equal representation, and very touchingly, love. These were the slogans. On, on the top of the pole of many a banner, there was a red cap of liberty, which was such a powerful emotive symbol of this time for popular movements or popular demands. This gathering, it seemed, instilled a sense of panic amongst the magistracy and they read the riot act and unleashed uh, forces. There were 600 hussars, several hundred infantrymen, an artillery unit with two six-pounder guns, other groups and a group of armed yeomanry who were let loose on this crowd. And the result was that they acted resulting in this massacre of men and women and children. Even the journalists were arrested. Those who escaped from that area were arrested later and therefore the first organized protest or one of the earliest organized protests seemed to elicit from the government not tolerance but extreme violence. This is why the term Peterloo had been used as an echo of Waterloo. The soldiers of Waterloo were considered as heroes but those of Peterloo were utter villains. Interestingly, one uh, gentleman, uh, John Edwards Taylor, after this went to set up what has gone down as the celebrated newspaper, Manchester Guardian. The Guardian newspaper started as a result of this. It has been suggested by historians that this indirectly led to ordinary people winning the right to vote later, as is a demand uh, uh, galvanized and it was considered later. 
there was a, a, a trade union movements, particularly the rise of the Chartist movement, the trade unions, and as I have noted, the Manchester Guardian newspaper. The Peterloo massacre also led to the six acts, which were repressive, which were absolutely conservative and reactionary. The uh, George IV, the king, died. General election followed. Even the Tories now felt that the reform was the only way out. The Whigs under Lord Grey were in favour of reform. But it's not that they wanted reform to establish democracy. We might quote, as, as uh, Grey himself said, that uh, the reform was supposed to be, quote, a final settlement and reconciliation between the governing aristocracy and the people, unquote. Parliamentary legislation become the real vehicle of change, uh, whether it was political, social or, or economic. In the, in the 18, late 1830s and 40s, we have the beginning of the Chartist movement. The reform, at least as David Thompson again, if I may quote him, has suggested, quote, they reflected a growing conscience about social ills and a willingness to try new ideas and embark on novel experiments in public administration. Politics came to be concerned more urgently and more continuously with the welfare of the community as a whole. The nation and the state had found one another and British life was enriched by their meeting. It is, it is this that uh, British liberalism uh, was, was, was about. And there was probably a consensus, but there were radicalism. Liberalism did not quite reform this. And in course of the 19th century, there had been other reforms. This is how the parliamentary system was sought to be reformed through parliamentary legislation and Britain managed to avoid extreme violence and clash amongst the classes, though the Chartist movement was one such strong working class movement and in Britain the working class movement grew later, but liberalism somehow managed to hold to power.